Welcome to this edition of my Fireside Chat. We have a very special guest joining us today, Mr. Frederick W. Smith, the Chairman and CEO of FedEx Corporation. Fred is the most recent speaker in one of our signature programs, the Delta State University Colloquia Distinguished Speakers Lecture Series. This ongoing series brings the campus high profile professionals who share career and life stories with our students, employees, and the community and provide an opportunity to hear from and engage with experts from a wide array of professions and interests. Former Governor William Winter served as our first colloquial speaker back in 2013. We're honored to have Fred with us today, especially because of his Delta ties uh, to Marks, Mississippi. Fred left the South in 1962 to enter Yale University, and it was while he was there that he wrote the famous paper for economics that outlined an overnight delivery service in the computer information age, and thus the beginning and early ideas for FedEx. After finishing at Yale, Fred was commissioned in the United States Marine Corps. He served for three years as a platoon leader and a forward air controller. He served two stints of duty in Vietnam, flying with pilots on more than 200 combat missions. He was honorably discharged in 1969 with the rank of captain, and he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and two Purple Hearts. In 1970, he purchased the controlling interest in an aircraft maintenance company, ARC Aviation Sales. And by 1971, he had turned its focus to trading used jets. On June 18, 1971, Mr. Smith founded Federal Express with his inheritance and uh, $91 million in venture capital. What an accomplishment that was for that time. And if these background traits and accomplishments weren't already enough to write home about, Fred is also the co-owner of the Washington Redskins National Football League team in our nation's capital. Fred, thanks so much for joining us today for this edition of Fireside Chat. We appreciate your being here and perhaps you could uh, begin by telling us a little bit about your roots in Mississippi and what that has meant to you throughout your career. Well, Bill, I certainly have used it to my advantage when I used to come up and see Senator Stennis and Senator Eastland and Senator uh, Cochran that you work for, and uh, I make sure they know I was born in Mississippi, but the reality is I just came early about three weeks. We had a farm here, and uh, I lived most of my life in Memphis nice. right up the road, right. but I certainly have a lot of affection for Mississippi, and I have a farm in Mississippi to this day right. that I'm there most weekends, so I great. consider myself at least a partial citizen of this great state. Well, we are glad about that. In your early days uh, conceiving this notion of this overnight uh, delivery package company, uh, did you ever have the uh, impression or the vision that it would grow to be the corporate giant it is today? Well, of course not. I mean, FedEx is a enormous enterprise today, almost $70 billion in revenue, 450,000 people, 220 countries, 664 airplanes, 5,000 uh, facilities, 150,000 vehicles. In fact, we've got a little film on the internet, fedex.com slash dream, hmm. where you can see all of the things I was just talking about. So no, I did not realize it would become uh, the uh, huge enterprise it is today. But I did know that it was a very, very important service that somebody had to provide the newly automating society that was beginning mm -hmm. to emerge in the 70s and the 80s. Right. Particularly in the information age itself. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, today, uh, if we lose our uh, device, our Samsung or our iPhone, our entire institutional memory is gone. Right. But you could begin to see those types of, of uses of uh, applied technology beginning in the early 1960s, the first generation of mainframe computers, the first generation of automated cockpits, mm -hmm. first generation of diagnostic machines and hospitals. You can just keep going on and on. And the problem with automating a function is you can't just call in a couple of extra people to, to, to do the job. You rely on the machine. So mm -hmm. that machine has got to be running all the time and the people make them have to be able to move the parts, mm -hmm. whether you're in Chicago or Los Angeles or Cleveland, Mississippi. And so the, the FedEx concept of a hub and spokes and an integrated air ground system allowed you to do that. And logistics that is a big part of it, isn't it? Well, it's totally the logistics. Yeah. Yeah. And logistics, by the way, is one of the most um, poorly understood aspects of 
of human society because it's very arcane and unless you're in it, mm -hmm. you just take it for granted that the eggs show up on the supermarket shelf or right. the computer part uh, keeps the factory running or what right. have you. But behind the scenes, it's a very, mm -hmm. very uh, esoteric and uh, quantitative discipline that keeps the entire society running. Absolutely. And of course, it, it, it's true in, in, in the military especially. Uh, most of the history of the world uh, in terms of the military history is really a story about logistics. It's not as much about the battles as people think it is. So uh, FedEx was just a response to a new type of society and that's what made us grow is yeah. because that society grew. What an incredible vision. Uh, along the way, what were the key principles or the golden nuggets you feel uh, really assisted you in building and growing the company? Well, the first thing is uh, we put a lot of emphasis on our people, particularly our front uh, uh, edge people, the people that dealt with the customers. A lot of that came from my four years in the Marine Corps. Uh, Marine Corps is a great institution in terms of teaching leadership. It's been successful for 200 years. There's a reason for that. So I applied a lot of that uh, to, to FedEx. In fact, I wrote a little article about it in the Naval Institute Proceedings, which is the Naval Academy's professional journal in 2008. Tells you all about it if you're interested mm -hmm. in it. And then I think secondarily, after our culture and, and focus on leadership uh, and motivation, it was our application of technology. Uh, we were very early on in adopting very, very sophisticated technologies we invented the ability to track a package, for instance, that had never been done before, and then we migrated into people's shipping rooms, and then we migrated it into to, uh, the internet, and then finally we've migrated it into your, uh, your phone, where you've got FedEx delivery manager on there, and you can manage your entire shipping universe and divert it here or divert it there mm -hmm. or have it held for you at Walgreens or deliver to you at two o'clock on Saturday or whatever right. the case may be. So that was the second thing I, I think. And then I think probably the third was to um, adopt very rigorous uh, quality management techniques which had been pioneered by the U.S. during World War II and then adopted by the Japanese which was a big part of their renaissance. But our quality driven management system is second to none in the world in terms of applying scientific uh, measurement and uh, management systems to constantly improve quality and customer satisfaction. And then I think, um, I think probably last is we were able to, to see a bit ahead of the curve how the world was going to go global. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, when we started it wasn't. I think probably international trade in those days may have been 7% of GDP mm -hmm. uh, and today of course uh, imports are subtracted from GDP in terms of the traditional measurement but imports and exports today are about 27% of the entire economic activity mm -hmm. of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we began to go internationally a long time before most right. people realized what a big big deal that was going to be. Right. So those were I think the four things. That's incredible. You, you envisioned, you looked in a crystal ball more than a half century ago and, and saw the dream for this type of a company. If you updated that today and you looked in a crystal ball, what's next? What, what's the future of international trade look like, particularly for the United States, from your special point of view? Well, international trade has been one of the uh, most significant developments in the modern age. Uh, Again, referring you back, it is an academic institution so that people are more interested in this in detail perhaps. I wrote a very long op-ed for the Wall Street Journal in March of 2016. And it talks about the, the modern history of trade, which really began with a very uh, bad piece of legislation. And uh, you're very familiar with the congressional system, the Smoot-Hawley mm -hmm. tariffs in 1930. Right. They had actually been proposed a year before and no question about it that they were a big part of the, uh, the Great Depression. Right. 
And one of the first things that Roosevelt and Cordell Hull, a good Tennessean, his Secretary of State did, was to try to reverse them, and they did in 1934. And Hull famously said, or it's attributed to him, that when goods cross borders, armies rarely do. And so the United States took uh, on the, the, the mantle of, of, of supporting open trade. And after World War II, uh, it was the United States that really uh, pushed hard for what became the World Trade Organization. Right. And uh, for those remarkable statistics that I mentioned, about 27% of everything that happens in this country economically today is due to imports and exports. I mean, our quality of life would be radically different if we didn't trade. We, we save about $14,000 per average family because we get goods of better quality. We, we export uh, just an enormous amount of airplanes and computers and precision parts and that's before you get to services and movies and mm -hmm. TV shows and FedEx and auditor services and things of that mm -hmm. nature. So the problem today about trade is really quite straightforward. It's become a political football, very successful in the Trump campaign, uh, but it was not in, in as accurate as it should have been because the real problem in trade today is the mercantilism of China. And China needs to, to stop doing that. Uh, we uh, championed their uh, entrance into the world trading system in 2001. And then I think when the United States got distracted by 9-11 and the Iraq uh, war, China began to, to really uh, engage in protectionism and uh, mercantilism. The Japanese had done it before. Mm -hmm. And they, they sort of went to school on that. But uh, hopefully cooler heads will prevail and the benefits of trade will be recognized and, and China will come around and be a, a better um, actor on the world stage in that regard. You bet. For the young person graduating from university, Delta State especially, mm -hmm. looking at that great big world out there, that global economy, what would be some of your best advice for them to prepare themselves for going into that world? Well, I think uh, you probably teach this in one way or another at Delta State, but you need to find something that you really like to do and that you are good at. And if you do those two things, you'll never work a day in your life. And if you don't do both of those things, you're not going to have a very enjoyable professional life. And let's face it, our work life <laughs> occupies a good part of our existence on this earth. So that, that's the first two things. I think the third is, um, you know, after recognizing those fundamentals, the, the, you have to be literate to some degree in the technologies of the day. You have to understand that the world is going to be very um, uh, focused on robotics, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, and, and whatever you do, you're likely to have to use some of those mm -hmm. disciplines to be able to be successful. The tools of the future. The tools of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, going, you're not going to, in the future, if you're a lawyer, you're going to uh, uh, the stacks in the library and have to sit there for days. You're going to say, I'd like to know all of the precedents on this type right. of case and the big data is going to go into it and probably mm -hmm. artificial mm -hmm. intelligence is going to come about and say, did you think about make a pleading like this? It looks like it's going to suggest to a physician, have you thought about the fact that this might be whatever, right. as opposed to what you might think it is. Right. So I think those three things are going to be very big and you have to, you don't have to be an expert and you can even be a liberal arts major, but you've got to be aware of what those things can do or what they can do to you to be successful, I think. That's terrific advice. You know, when we visited a couple of years ago up in your office in Memphis, um, uh, you had a dossier on your desk, and I brought one with me that included a lot of Delta State alums who worked mm, for you in FedEx. Yeah. And I want to thank you yeah. publicly for that. Well, for, that's the other way around. We want to thank Delta State because these are v valued members of our team. So well, great, great. <laughs> we, we, uh, we think you produce great 
great folks, and we hire just about as many of them as we can get our hands on. Well, we like that very much, yeah. and we appreciate very much your coming and spending time yeah. with us. Uh, you make Delta State and Mississippi and all of the South and the world proud of what you've done, and we appreciate your being with us in the Delta. Thank you for having me here, Bill. You bet. Appreciate it. You bet. What a treat to have Fred Smith on the Delta State campus. To keep up with all of our news and events and activities and to think about and see things just like we've done today, having this giant from the business world on our campus, visit our website at deltastate.edu. And thanks again for joining me today. See you next time.